Saika did. Saika, it's visible. Uh, you can put yeah. it upside down too. Uh, it doesn't bother us, I guess. Okay. Maybe that's that's much easier to. Uh, so, fix do you it. mean by this angle, like uh, over yeah, here? Yeah, a slight angle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me just try to place. Clamp it and then the, the gooseneck should should be adjusted. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it pulled in now? This paper. Oh, that's okay, right? Yeah. 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 Does it just rotate or doesn't? Yeah, just you have to bend it. Now? Yeah. Okay, then it's it has to be at an angle. Should I tighten it now? Uh, like that at that angle? Just... Uh, is this visible now or uh, can you stretch your hand to the topmost? Yeah, I think that's visible. Yeah. That's thank you. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess the uh, the artist's microphone is muted. The one which is showing the um, the fine art league of Cupertino. Um, That's fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for joining us online. I'll try to remember to look at the camera here. Um, uh, my name is Jamal Diamond. Uh, I am a, a San Jose, Sunnyvale based artist. Uh, I grew up in Stockton uh, in the uh, Central Valley. I actually went away to theater school in St. Louis, Missouri, and then moved to Chicago and uh, decided I want to be a graphic designer after doing theater for a while. And uh, I had a hallway conversation with someone once, and I said, oh, I want to be a graphic designer. And he said, oh, well, uh, you have to go to school for that. I was like, oh, that sounds hard and expensive. Uh, and what ended up happening is I ended up getting a job at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, I just answered a random job ad and got a, a job there. And so I worked at the school for nine years, so almost a decade of uh, working at an art school. And it was the most amazing art education I could possibly you know, ask for. Every single day, getting exposed to uh, painting and drawing and fiber arts and video and um, multimedia and performance art and every kind of art, uh, uh, furniture making. Uh, and so after about three years of working there, I got my portfolio up to a place where I felt confident enough to apply for the grad program at the school. And so I got into the visual communications department, and uh, but really focused on design. So uh, I wanted to be an artist, but I also really wanted to not be a starving artist. I wanted to make a living. And so uh, I focused on design. Uh, the other people in my program were ran the whole gamut of, of disciplines. So there were painters, there were video people, there were all sorts of people who were all working on visual, visual arts. Uh, and there are a couple other designers 
Um, but uh, I got my MFA in visual communications, and that's what I do for a full time living now. So I'm a graphic designer at a, a tech company in, in Silicon Valley. And uh, in my spare time, I do this. Uh, it's really this wonderful mix in my life of design and art. So it's all creativity, it's all visual communication, communicating something visually. Design is very uh, a different beast in terms of the way you do it. It's a lot of grids and uh, it is you know reasoning and marketing, uh, whereas abstract kind of lets go of that you know need for it has to be this or it has to be that. But it also relies on the exact same kind of skills that you do with graphic design. There's still hierarchy. There's things that you look at first, second, and third. Uh, there is uh, motion, uh, color, and all the things that go into graphic design also go into abstract art. So um, uh, I was in school, it was a two-year program, and it took me three years because I was working full-time while I was doing that, uh, and then graduated, and then worked there for I think, another three years before I moved back here to California because it was just too cold in <laughs> Chicago. Uh, really cold for, for all those years. Uh, but I really loved it. I love Chicago. It's an amazing cultural city. A lot of public art that I really like. Um, a one kind of pivotal moment uh, while I was in school that really kind of led to my abstract uh, drawing style is uh, I was having a phone conversation with someone. I was on the phone and I had these Sharpie markers and I was just kind of doodling as I was talking on the phone. So I was focused on the conversation, you know, just kind of, you know, doodling around. And when I got off the phone, I looked down and there was this like drawing that I had done without any of my conscious mind, you know, judging it or deciding anything about it. I hadn't even really noticed what I was doing until I looked down after the phone uh, conversation. And I've been trying to duplicate that experience for 25 years. Uh, just getting to this place where, for me, drawing and painting is this very meditative, very zen, uh, uh, freeing kind of method. Uh, I don't, my style of creation is improvisational. So there's no uh, deciding what I'm gonna do and then execute on that idea. I just kind of start. I'll kind of show you that process where it's just starting and just really playing with uh, the uh, pigment, and uh, there are, I've developed over the years, things that I like to um, uh, indicate uh, that helps people, viewers, think of different things. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but so that was one moment when I was in school where I had a phone call. I was like, wow, abstract art where you're not thinking about it and you're not focused on it. You're just, you know, it's like when we're doodling in the margins of our paper, when we're focused on something else, that, the stuff that's in the margin, that's what's really interesting to me. Uh, the other moment that I had in school uh, that really kind of changed my trajectory was uh, I would bring my drawings to my friends and I would say, well, what do you think? And so they would look at these abstract drawings and say, oh, I see a fire engine on fire and people running all around and with hoses. And I'd look down and look at them and they'd say, well, that's what it is, right? And so I, just started saying, yeah, yeah, that's right. If that's what you see, then that's amazing. Then yeah, that's of course that's what it is. And it just really made me think a bunch of different things. One is it was not as important to me what I intended uh, for it to be. I was really interested in that dialogue that came back when someone else told me what they saw in the abstract drawing. Like that's really interesting in that dialogue between the artist and the audience, where they're telling you what it, uh, what it means to them. And I've had people over the years go into great detail on my abstract art of the things that mean to them, the symbols that they see, the, you know, the imagery that they see, and it really comes from their own imagination and their own experience. And I really started liking that much more than any intention that I was trying to do. So there was, uh, in the early days of online uh, art, uh, online blogging. Uh, if anyone remembers, there's a, a blogging platform called Live Journal. Um, getting old, it was a long time ago. Uh, but there were the art groups. And so I had a scanner, and so I would scan my drawings and I would post them in these online art groups. 
and I wanted other people to give me their ideas. And so at some point, I just came up with the term title. And so that just became my little tag. When I uploaded some art, I would just say title me without any other context, without saying, oh, this is a piece I've been working on, this and that, there's just no context. All they had was the art and a little label that said title me. And the titles just started rolling in. Really creative, really interesting uh, titles, things I had never thought of, things that made me look at my art in a different way because of a particular title that someone else uh, gave me. I've now been asking other people to title my artwork now for about the same time, 25 years. Uh, I've been collecting titles. I collect them all. I have a ginormous database of titles that other people have given me for my artwork. And when I show the art, uh, I pick one of their titles and I put that on the label and that's on, and that's on the label. So every time you see piece of my art and it's in a gallery or anywhere, the title of it is given to me by someone else. So almost a collaboration between me and the viewer. And then uh, when I show the piece again, I select a different title. So you might see the same from the art, but it has a completely different title because I chose a different one. Some titles are really good and they stick with the piece for a long time. Some of them stick in my mind, uh, but all of them make me look at the artwork in a different way because someone else saw something that I, that I didn't see that used their creativity. And it really changes depending on what that title is or how you see the artwork. So I really fell in love with that. And it really, to me, kind of brought in this distinct process of communicating with abstract art. If anyone is abstract artists, I find that abstract work is harder to interpret from people who aren't artists. Uh, a lot of people, when they look at art, they're like, it's abstract. Oh, well, what is it? I can't tell what it is. And so therefore I don't like it. And I found the simple question to them, what would you title this? If you had to come up with a title, what would it be? And it just kind of is this nice little invitation for people to like, oh, I could, I could think of something. I could think of a, a title. And it just kind of encourages them to get over that gap of, I don't know what abstract art is. I don't know what it is. Therefore, I don't like it. Oh, but now I've been invited to title it. And it kind of gives them the opportunity to have access into a world that they may not be, have to be accustomed to. And so I just fell in love with that. And like I just the same thing that I've been trying to duplicate the drawing I made on the phone that day, I've been just trying to get more and more titles. I have an insatiable desire for more titles. I can't possibly get enough. Uh, and I just really love uh, all the different arrays of um, perspective that other people give when they have uh, a title. And so uh, I've expanded it in the last few years and I started titling my art shows based on a title that someone else gave me. So now when I have an art show, I look, I pick a piece uh, that kind of has a good title and then that becomes the title of the show. So I've kind of elevated it even from the label. Now it's a whole title of the show. And then I get to credit whoever gave me that title and it really gives them a nice kind of ownership and they're kind of connected. And my friends and other people get really excited when their title gets, gets chosen. And so it's that dialogue with myself and the audience that I just really love and really yearn for. Sometimes people are frustrated. They don't like it. That, you know, when I say, when they say what it is, and they say, is that what it is? Well, like, yeah, that's what it is. Like, but what did you mean? And I'm like, to me, that's not as interesting. And I can tell you, you know, what I was thinking or what I was going through uh, when I made it, but what the dialogue, what you think is way more interesting. That said, uh, throughout the years, um, a lot of motifs have kind of come through uh, my work. So um, it's a dichotomy of line. So a lot of my drawings are just, they're just line work. They're just lines. But uh, I try now, I have a very specific process in contradicting and affirming the lines. So I'll show you that I'll make a shape, but then I'll go over that shape with a different shape that kind of contradicts that shape. And then I'll go over that line with another contra contradicting line that's opposite of what that shape is. If it's something feminine, uh, then I'll go over it with either something masculine or something that's more robotic or round. If it's organic shape, 
then I'll go over it with a more rectangular or building shape. And to me, that's just kind of building in the dichotomy for when the viewer looks at it, they may see the feminine shape and think it's something feminine. They may see the masculine shape, see something masculine. They may see a robot because there's all these squares and shapes, or they may see you know, a map you know, from above where you're looking down and looking at buildings you know, from, from bird's eye or from a satellite view. Um, so that part is like very specific. So I very am intentional with that dichotomy, but what you're gonna interpret is really, really up to you of how you see those shapes. Sometimes you'll see them, sometimes you won't. A lot of the work is figurative, where I've seen to do lots of people in various different poses and doing different things. But then also I do cityscapes a lot. Uh, I do portraits uh, and kind of full body pieces, but it is all improvisational, nothing planned. I'm not the kind of artist that, and I very much admire the artists that are, that have a vision of what they're gonna create and then they make it. Uh, and that, uh, I love that not my process whatsoever. I start with a very blank piece of paper and I try to start with a very blank mind, you know, with kind of letting those thoughts and those voices in your head that tell you not to create or tell you that what you're doing is uh, bad or should be better, kind of letting go of those voices is really now an integral part of my process where, um, and I think really that to me is like the hindrance uh, and the kind of the biggest, I don't want to say evil, but the biggest challenge that artists has is that interior thoughts, you know, that letting those thoughts seep in that, oh, this should be that, this should be this, this should be better, this should be that and that. And I think it was years, it took me a lot of years of practice of kind of getting those voices quieted and kind of letting them go and not judging the artwork. You know, let the uh, critics, you know, judge the artwork, let other people judge it. But my job is to not judge it, is to let it be unjudged. And you might like it, you might not. I might like it, I may not. I have certain criteria that I think works. And sometimes a lot of it just doesn't work. I'll create and create and create, and it just didn't, didn't come together. And for me, that's just kind of part of the process where some of them work, some of them don't. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's just part of the process. Um, any questions so far on that? Uh, I don't know if I can uh, answer questions from online, but if anyone here has a question, uh, feel free to, I feel free to ask. Yes? That is really, as you say, like some of them have a vision and they know something. It's a reference. So like, for me, like, I like to have some reference when I do. So you said you have a blank mind and you just put stuff on the paper. How does it work? Well, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you that I just start. I mean, but like how how did you talk to your brain to your heart that I want to do something? Yeah. Well, uh, I try to let go about what I want on paper. What I want more than what I want on paper is I want to create. It's that process. I just want to create. I just want to make things and make and make and make. And uh, again, I have that insatiable desire to just create. And um, uh, what, ooh, I can hear myself. myself. Weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It's very, that, I think that's the hardest part. A lot of people, a lot of artists I find, they have trouble starting. Like, where do I start? And for me, it's the opposite. I have the trouble like, where do I stop? Is it done? Is it not done? And it works a lot of different ways for me. Some ways it's finished and my final, I sign it. That's kind of for me, the symbol of like, I'm done. But also I have pieces in my studio that sit around for weeks and months and I pick it up again. I'm like, oh, I think I'd like to do a little more. And it also has happened the opposite way where I just, I did too much. It was too much. And the interesting thing recently that I've noticed uh, when I'm creating in my studio, I make time-lapse videos. So I have to set up a camera. And if you look at my Instagram, you'll see a lot of the time-lapse videos. And those are really great because 
you can see an hour, two hours, three hours worth of work in a very, you know, in 30 seconds. So it's a great way to kind of see my whole process without standing there for three hours, because that's really me. And I take a break and I walk around and, you know, move my body. And so getting to see that condensed. But what it shows to me a lot is uh, recently I was just looking at a time lapse and I saw a moment. I was like, oh, there it was. That's when I should have stopped, but it didn't stop. I kept going and I covered it and I covered it and I covered it and it was just too much. And so it's a good question and I don't have a good answer to when do you stop? It's just a feeling, you know, it's a, sometimes it's fatigue. I'm tired, I'm gonna go home. Uh, and like I said, sometimes I think it's done and it gets put in my studio and then I'm kind of looking at it later and I'm like, oh, I think I might, you know, add a little bit to it. And I've had pieces in my studio that have sat there for a year. And then I pick it up I'm like, oh, I think I'll add a little embellishment to it or, or add to it. Um, uh, and so it kind of goes that whole spectrum of finish. But that is the challenge of when do you stop? When is too much? And often I get past that place where it's too much. And that's just the way it is. I'm creating with acrylic and I'll talk a little bit about the materials uh, that I've got here as well. Uh, but uh, there's no eraser. Uh, also part of that process of not judging yourself uh, is, you know, there is no undo and really this, you have to build a, a new relationship to mistakes and kind of let go of what a mistake is, you know? And a lot of times like I'll get fingerprints on my pieces because I'll have paint on my hand and I'll touch it or I'll spill, I've spilled paint on my, and my initial reaction is like, oh no. And I've tried to kind of recontextualize that like, oh, that was the universe saying there's going to be a lot more paint on this now because I've spilled it or there's going to be fingerprints on it. And I just kind of accept that that's part of the process. It's messy. It's not, there's, you know, there's not a lot of reasoning behind what might happen. It just kind of happened. And then I just have to, you know, make my peace with it and say, well, yep, yeah, there's fingerprints all over it. A lot of people like that. They like the kind of seeing the artist's literal touch on the piece and the imperfections of painting and the style and splatter, you know, I'll splatter accidentally all the time or I'll mix colors, I'll forget to wait for it to dry and I'll go over a color and it just smears and it gets paint on my other markers and stuff like that. And that's just kind of part of the process. Yeah. So the materials that I've got, I can like hold them up to the camera so people can see online. Uh, I used to do a lot of ink and then I kind of graduated out of ink into acrylic. Um, I'm mainly a drawer as opposed to a painter. So I'm much more comfortable with pens than I am with, with brushes and putting paint on a brush and put, applying that on a canvas. I do do a lot of that, do, do a lot of painting, but for, because this is like, a little, uh, this is a little neater uh, for a demo, I just bring these kind of pens. I really like them. Uh, it's all acrylic paint. They all have that little ball inside that mixes up the paint. This is uh, a brand called Montana. Uh, and uh, I'll show it to the camera. It's a very thick nib on this, on this marker. And so uh, a kind of pen like this was given to me by a friend of mine who's a, a graffiti artist. So this is a very common kind of marker that people will do the kind of tagging with because it's really, you know, juicy and, you know, and they can just draw and tag and he handed it to me and I was like, oh my God, I really like this. And so then I started buying acrylic markers. Uh, these are the thickest ones, although I think I have one that's even thicker, it's probably about an inch and a half, you know, wide. And it goes, runs the whole gamut to, you know, pens like this. This is uh, uh, Arteza is the brand and it has really thin uh, marker or a thin, uh, thin tip on it. So the camera, very, very thin. Uh, and so I layer, so I start with the thicker pens to kind of do the backgrounds and then go on top with the thinner and thinner pens. There's also, I think my favorites are these. This is a brand called Magic Fly and they're just dual tipped. So on one side, they have like a Sharpie kind of nib, and then on the other side, a much thinner 
nib as well. So much thinner. This one is called uh, Magic Fly is the brand. Um, all of them I buy online. Uh, I don't, I try not to do too much retail shopping just for uh, the price. So I try to go to the right to the manufacturers to buy their products. Um, also just, I don't love shopping and looking for the thing I need online experience to me is a lot better. I can find the things I want and then reorder the ones that I already, you know, liked. Uh, the Montana ones are really great in that not only can you replace the nibs, you can just pull the nib out and replace it so you have a new nib. They're also refillable. So you can unscrew it. And if you buy, I think they brought one, but you can buy replacement paint and just kind of pour it back in and have a nib. And so it's a much more cost-effective way to use these. Not all of them are like that. Some of the smaller ones, you can't replace it, but the Montana ones, uh, you can. Yeah, yeah, it's water-based acrylic paint, yeah. Yeah, and so that's mainly what all these are. Mainly, you know, so when I tied up, when I put the labels on, uh, I just call it acrylic on paper. Because uh, sometimes there'll be brushes, but mostly it's just uh, uh, the markers are acrylic on canvas. If it's on canvas today, I'm just uh, painting on paper. Mm -hmm. It works exactly Yeah, yeah, it's watery. It's, it's, it's very liquidy. That's why I usually create flat. Uh, and not on an easel or vertical because it'll just drip. Yeah, and so if you want the drips, then great, and you can do that. But for the most part, because of at least these, the, the these aren't as, there isn't as much water uh, in there. So these don't drip as much, but the big ones really drip. So I tend to work more flat like this. I also work with a hairdryer uh, to dry the layers. Uh, I kind of learned that technique. Uh, a lot of times I'll do, a couple of pieces at a time so that one can dry while I'm working on another. And then I rotate it back in while that one's dry. I'll take the uh, hand dryer and kind of manually dry it so that I can go over. But the acrylic really sits on top of each other really well. Uh, I especially like how the white will look on the darker colors. And I never quite could find that with ink. You know, you can't really, there's not a lot of white ink pens that will really sit on black, but the acrylic does it really well it really kind of pops off. And so I do a lot of white detail on the darker, on the darker colors. Mm -hmm. Amazon. Yeah, for the most part, that's why I buy uh, all of it. Some of them come from overseas. Uh, some of them are American companies. Uh, the Montana, I think is an American company. Um, Magic Fly, I think is a Japanese company. Um, and I'm not sure about Tosca. Is another type that's a very Japanese, also Japanese. So these really good. I like these a lot. Yeah, Tosca's are great. The colors are just really bright and rich. Uh, and so that's the, the, that's the material. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the uh, Arteza, A R T E Z A, acrylic marker with plastic nibs. But they all have the little ball in there to like mix it up. Yeah. Yep. So it's all mostly watercolor paper. This is um, this is a hundred and forty pound uh, watercolor paper uh, that I'll use today. The thicker, the better, because of the water that's in the paint. It really will. Uh, if the paper's too thin, it'll warp. Uh, so I try to go, I'd even go thicker if I could find even heavier than 140 some printmaking papers will go a little thicker uh, than 140. What is it? RG block, yeah. Uh, cold, cold press. Yep, yeah. cold press, yeah. Uh, that's one brand and Hanson is that brand. And Strathmore is the other uh, brand of paper that I that I really like. Uh, but it is this is acrylic, and this is oh this is two hundred forty six pounds. So this is uh, a lot thicker than the than the bigger sheets, but harder to find in the bigger in the bigger sizes. I also started doing um, more uh, standard sizes because I realized I was spending a lot of money on custom framing. 
you know, so I was buying all these different sizes sheets, and then there's no standard frame for those, so you have to have a custom frame. And so I, I started doing much more standard. So this is a you know 18 by 24. I have a smaller pad, 12 by 18. So now I'm kind of much more uh, strategic in the sizes that I use, so that they I can get frames uh, that that will fit them. Uh, I brought two pieces as an example. Those over there. Um, I also started a long time ago standardizing the kind of frames that I get because uh, I do art shows a lot and uh, I'd have all sorts of different kind of colored frames. And so I standardized the kind of frame that I get, black metal. I standardized the kind of mat that I get so they're all matched so I can put any piece together and they all kind of match each other. And I also uh, get non-glare acrylic as the glaze uh, in front of it. Um, for my art gallery, uh, Kalai Gallery downtown, they have a very low ceiling and it's like an old bank building. And so it's an office building square lights. And if you have glass, it just reflects all of that light and hard to see the art. This is really nice because it just doesn't reflect that art. Um, it, it dampers the color a little bit. So the glass, the color comes out, but not, not too much. I think the trade-off for me at least is worth it. Uh, uh, to not have that the the reflection and also earthquake safe uh, using acrylic as opposed to glass. So if it were to fall, it would maybe crack, but it would not shatter everywhere. Uh, and I mean, I had not everyone loves this, you know, kind of uh, kind of frame. And so I tell people that. Uh, if you uh, if you buy it, then you can frame it however you like. If you want to take it out, you know this style is a very nice uh, style in that um, they come the place I bought. I'm from come in a kit, so it's all put together. And all you have to do is unscrew the little screws that are here and take off just one side, slide out the mat and the backing, put your artwork in, put it together, slide it back in, and screw and, and screw back in the little hinges and uh, it's a really nice um, uh, uh, method for doing it yourself if you don't want to spend money on having custom frame and I did that for years and years and years and I just like okay I got to do it myself uh, just to cut down on the labor cost you know the materials weren't so bad but it's the labor of having them do it and so I started doing it myself but uh, I all these frames come from a place called framedestination.com and frame destination, framedestination.com. They're in Texas, so there is shipping costs. Uh, and I buy in bulk, and so it's big shipping costs when they send you a big, you know, a pallet full of materials. But the more you buy, the the more of a break you get. Uh, and so I try when I do buy, I try to buy a lot, so uh, so I get that discount from them. But I really like the kits that they come in, and and the process. It still takes about an hour. Maybe or once I got better, a little faster, but you still have to be careful. That you don't scratch it or you know mess it up. And but to me, this has been the most cost effective way to it Yeah. Well, when you're making on their website, when you make the kit, you choose what kind of frame you want, you choose what kind of mat, you choose what kind of glaze that you have in it. So you build the little kit and then it comes off assembled for you. When I first ordered, I thought, oh, it's just going to be like a stack of the acrylic, a stack of all the metal pieces, and I'd have to put it together, but they do all the, you know, putting it together for you, so you receive it like this, and all you do, you have to do this part too, so there's the little clips, and you have to tie the, the wires and make it to make it to size, so a little labor involved there, but not, not, not much, but I like them a lot. They're, they're... Yes. Metal, yeah. No. No. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so I'll go ahead and just kind of show you some of my process. And like I said, it's improvisational. I haven't planned out anything. Um, just kind of, kind of draw while, um, while I'm talking to you. I do use gloves. I learned that lesson. You know, if you get acrylic all over your hands, there's only so many times you can scrub your hands to get the paint off. So I recommend 
uh, gloves with it just so your 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 hands stay clean. But it does definitely does not prevent the fingerprint. So I still get you know pigment on this that can get on the paper. But I recommend gloves. And also I just like these kind because they're reusable as opposed to the uh, uh, the rubber masks you know that are that you throw them away after each after each use. So there we go, blue. So a lot of times with acrylic work, you know, I'll just kind of start, you know, with a basic like head shape, and then I'll just do the, the body body shape like that. Sometimes I, I color them in, sometimes not. Sometimes I come in and color them with a different color. And also, like, you know, if you push the nib down, then more can come back. And so that kind of helps you with the streaks. Also, um, I have to uh, sometimes go over it with extra layers uh, to get it really uh, thick so you don't see uh, the, the streaks uh, in it. If you only go over it once, you are easy to see the, the streaks. But sometimes I just don't care. Sometimes you see the streaks. And so these are just kind of, you know, random, you know, leg, leg shapes. Uh, I'm a fan of, uh, if you see my work, Picasso, uh, Clay, Calder, Moreau, or some a lot of my influences. Um, so what I like about those artists is that it's playful, uh, it's fun, very colorful. And so just kind of a basic, you know, uh, uh, figure, the head, you know, body, arms and legs. But uh, I definitely try to stay away from realism. I like exaggerated gestures and I don't worry about proportion. Like, oh, you know, arms have to be when you're trying something realistically, you know, the, your arms have to be proportioned to the body. And I just don't don't worry about that. My figures are exaggerated. Uh, they don't have the right, you know, I'm not worrying about the, um, the structure of bones and ribs that people who are making, you know, realistic art, you have to kind of think about how the body is really, uh, really made. And uh, just for this process, uh, I don't worry about it too much. I'm just kind of having, having fun. I also, you know, I don't think too much about the colors. I just kind of like grab colors. I do kind of, when I pull them out, I, I keep them out, but I just remember which blue. I learned that lesson too, is I put the blue back in, then I didn't remember which of the blues I was using. So I usually uh, leave them out. Uh, this is a nice, nice red. And I just love like how much, you know, paint comes out. And it kind of the hint of another another figure that's with this first figure. Sometimes I go back and try to you know get the edges. The edges will get a little rough if I'm going faster, and I go back a little slower so that those edges are are clean. And sometimes I just don't don't worry about it. So at this point, it's probably usually where I get out the hair dryer, and so I've worked on like kind of draw, you know, drawing, uh, drying this layer before I before I went over, and so uh, it's another leg over here maybe, and sometimes they're not interpreted as legs. Like I'm kind of thinking about it as a body, but sometimes people interpret you know the parts as different things. I'm also kind of going for things shapes that are organic and non-organic. Uh, this may be, you know, a structure as opposed to a And I don't know if you'll see, but I just splattered like red, you know, red pigment all over it because I like, you know, it stuck on the paper and it just splatters. And that's just kind of part of part of the process and part of this uh, piece. Uh, like I said, it's improvisational and not, you know, precise. I'm not going trying to do something very specific. Um, what's that? You have a title already? Oh my God, I can't wait. Well, what is it? What's your title? 
Tango with teapot. That's good. Tango with teapot. Love it. Yeah. Yep. Nope. Nope. No, I have a great picture of uh, my drawings when I was a kid. A picture of me. And when I look at the drawings, you look at my drawings now, not a lot has changed. It's very, very similar. And, you know, it's that, that idea of Picasso where he was like working to like keep that childish, you know, energy and keep, you know, the children haven't learned to judge themselves. They're just creating for the pure joy of creating. And that's what I like to try to duplicate. That just pure joy of, of creating something that, you know, comes out of your uh, imagination. I have a question. Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably some. I think there's because I have this deep design, you know, background, uh, and I've been doing it for so many years that there's probably some things that are going unconscious in my mind. So when I look at something, you know, there's a reason why I added this because it felt a little empty. So I'm probably going for some balance, you know, um, or if I'm going to do something that's off balance, I want to be really specific are really intentional of why it's, you know, on unbalanced. So there's probably some things about composition that are going on in my mind, but they're not, they're not conscious decisions. Besides looking at something, going, oh, I think it needs something more over here because that would make it more, more balanced. Uh, probably that's the only thing that I think about is like having balance in the composition so that it just feels balanced. So the red is done with the blue is a little closer to dry. So now I'm going to go with this lighter blue. I forgot sometimes I have scratch pads. And I'm just going to kind of go over it. It kind of just gives a circle to the head. So when it comes over it, you know, it's like when I talk about this kind of composition of shapes. And so it kind of just gives a round shape that is curved over this very but some of us are robotic shape. And so then if we refer now as we come over here with the uh, you know non-curved shape, more angular, more some people would you know interpret it as robotic, but I'm just kind of using it to kind of contradict the layer that was underneath and do something uh, a little different. I also do, you know, when I start decorating. So I'll start, you know, putting more detail in, and sometimes it's clothing. So I'll do, you know, make it look like there's shirts or there's clothing on top. But then sometimes I'll do, you know, bones that are inside. Again, just trying to create that dichotomy. Uh, you're seeing someone from the outside, you'd see clothing, but if they were transparent, then you would see the bones. And so that's kind of part of the dichotomy that I like, is that am I looking at the outside? Am I looking at the inside? And it really depends on what you, you know, what you see in that moment. So a lot of the details will be kind of, uh, when I was at the Art Institute, a very influential floor uh, for me was a uh, fashion floor. So you go to the fashion floor as an art school and they have all the cut uh, cloth as they make designs. And I just love those fashion illustrations. And so I see the fashion illustration in my work a lot where they have all these different textures and fabric and they're very tall, slender figures, you know, with these beautiful dresses on. So I still see a lot of that in my drawings uh, from art school, being so kind of enamored of that. Fashion illustrations. I also really love children's illustrations as well. Uh, more in Sendak, you know, where the wild things are, very influential uh, on me. And these are just kind of abstracted, maybe they, you know, maybe they read as uh, toes or fingers or other things. Maybe it's clothing. And again, I'm not worried about having the right amount of toes or the right amount of fingers or only having one hand. Sometimes there'll be two, two hands. Maybe it's not interpreted as a hand, but a cloud or a flower or depending on how you're gonna, gonna see it. Yeah. And uh, often, you know, some sort of indications are faces. But I'm very specific in trying to break 
the uh, uh, symmetry uh, faces. Picasso, you know, in the cubism, trying to look at things from all these different uh, uh, sides. So I really like that. I really like how, you know, kind of messed up Picasso's drawings looked like to me when I was younger, that the eyes were never symmetrical. There's always, you know, that change. So I think that influenced me over the years. And, um, and then kind of contradicting those lines to say the straight and like have uh, some sort of curved line like that. And then a lot of time it's just kind of, you know, decorating, just kind of doodling, just kind of adding little, little details. Perhaps I'm a big fan of circles, so lots of circles. You know, I like clouds, so you'll see clouds in my work a lot. And sometimes, you know, do little lines that maybe that looks like hair, maybe it looks like fringe, if it's uh, clothing. I do antennas a lot, you know, that kind of robots with antennas. And, you know, I work on a lot of, uh, in my day job, uh, IoT, you know, Internet of Things, and all these connected things. So I always kind of like that idea that that relationship between people and technology, where, you know, we're all connected to, they're, technology in our phone and the cloud and connecting to that. Uh, so that's a lighter blue. And now I'll go over maybe with a, a pink on the red. Is it also random or it's the years of experience that comes to your mind? It's random. Well, it's an all three, all three. Uh, one, it's random. I'm just kind of picking colors. I also too, this is a very unique drawing experience where I'm talking. I'm usually not talking and just kind of, you know, quiet in my mind with, with, with music. Um, but it's also the experience of knowing that lighter colors are gonna sit on top of the darker colors. And so kind of making sure you kind of start the dark and go to light. Because if I started light, then the darks would just kind of cover over it. But sometimes I do that. Sometimes it's gonna be there real quick. So then it usually starts with darker. So this isn't quite dry, but I'm going to draw it in. I kind of do this like shapes, and then I'm just kind of doodling on here. And then maybe I'll also do kind of contradictory shapes with it. Yeah, and it's not quite dry, so it's doing interesting things. And I'll do a square with a head and then sometimes some ears and sometimes like the pink and the red are kind of mixing, mixing together. And I like that. And then, you know, once I, ooh, that's a lot of trigger. Yeah, sometimes you just do that. If you just press down, then the pink, the acrylic just kind of pours out of the pen like that. I also try to keep my grip very light. I'm not trying not to like have tension in my drawing. Just kind of have this light, uh, light touch. I think that just kind of helps the improvisation and uh, it doesn't fatigue you. I found if I'm tense and kind of squeezing the pen, then it's not that I'll, I'll get tired quicker from holding it like that. So I try to do it really, really loosely like that. And then also sometimes the colored parts. That's I'm also trying to do a, a dichotomy of emotion. Maybe you'll see that the figures are happy. Maybe you'll see them that they're sad. And I'm trying to going going for both. I'm trying to go for uh, you know that that uh, abstract, non-specific, so you get to decide for yourself. If it's a happy or sad, uh, sad figure. Yeah, the pink really looks nice on the, on the blue. So again, I think the only really conscious thing I'm thinking about is that balance. You know, if there's a lot of circles here, then that has to be set over here too. Just kind of thinking about that as I'm going, but not being too specific about what the circles are or 
and just kind of decorating, decorating or messing it up sometimes. You know, uh, uh, my son will take my drawings and he'll just draw all over it, kind of con trying to contradict everything that, that I've done. So sometimes it feels like that, that I've drawn this nice thing and now I'm graffitiing all over my own drawing. Uh, the one downside of using red is that is that the colors are pretty dependent. Right, so there's not a lot of mixing colors. Like I'd have to really pour these out to like mix them, and then I'd have to get them back in a pen. And so that's a, a limitation of these tools is that I'm not able to, you know, mix and create my own colors like you would if you're using you know, acrylic with a with a brush. And so I like doing that when I do paint, then I, I have much more uh, freedom in the, what colors uh, I make. And so this is limited to that. But then the benefit of it is that when I go, if I can find the right pen, I know that the right blue, right? Whereas opposed to when you're painting, sometimes I'll like run out of that color and you got to make it, and then you got to match it so that it matches the color that you've already, you have already used. So, Pros and cons with everything. Mm -hmm. Again, no real rhyme or reason for the yellow, but just trying to like find some balance so that it kind of has a, an even amount. Now that I've got a light color, you know, the yellow, you know, it can bring, come back with a, with a darker. But what I really love is the white on these colors. So I'll show you, you know, what you get. Uh, and that's what I really like about this acrylic is the white just really fits it. Just to pick this pen up. It just really fits really nicely on that blue. You know, I just never found this like, to work with me, it never quite worked like this. So the white just kind of just kind of made me like that. And again, I'm just kind of contemplating with it. So the rectangular section that doesn't occur, that other rectangle that doesn't occur. Just kind of details of my fingers. And just letting the you know the inconsistency of the pen marks just kind of be part of it and not worry too much that they're not they're not perfect. So the white really really fits on these dark colors. And then the same thing, the black on the really you know thin black. Oops. I've never been used before. Oh, so brown. Oh, never mind. What a uh, these containers are from Michaels. So some I didn't buy from Amazon. Uh, but these are really nice just because they can hold all the all the pens and then they stack nicely in those uh, carrying boxes. You know, and this is this kind of solid band, and so I'm kind of contradicting it with a, with a curvy, maybe it's hair, you know, maybe it's clouds, maybe it's just decoration.
I really like a lot of times I'll do kind of annotations as you would have like in a medical drawing or an informational infographic where you've got, you know, kind of annotations saying this is that. So I'll do kind of abstracted versions of that where I'm just kind of indicating, you know, something like maybe it's a, a measurement or maybe this is just kind of a abstracted. Have you tried this on the canvas? Yeah, I have. Uh, not as successful. Um, lots of different challenges with the canvas. Um, I learned uh, you on canvas, you need to do a couple layers of primer uh, before you start because the, the texture of canvas really like it's a bumpy as you're drawing. And um, it uh, sometimes I found some of these, they're different, but some of them, they're made of cotton, I think the nibs, and the fiber comes off onto the canvas and then embeds itself uh, in the paint when the surface is too. So they don't, and generally, especially like Posca pens, they're really meant to be on a very smooth surface. So it works a little better on paper, on metal or other things if it's a smooth texture. And so I learned, I've done a lot of canvases, uh, but I've realized that you really do need to make, give yourself a much smoother uh, surface than raw not canvas because it's just very very bumpy whereas a, a brush would be fine over that because you've got lots of pigment at the brush but these are a little harder on that texture as it bumps and then it pulls that the little cotton uh, out of it uh, but uh but yeah the canvases i usually do the thicker layers with a brush for the more damn bigger canvases so uh, i'll do a brush and then i'll go over that with these these markers. Uh, still, yeah, still your title. Is it, is it different now? Uh -huh. I'll just stop for a moment. Just kind of give you a, a view. All right. Yes. I see Techie. Techie? Technical. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of the kids. Oh. They and, and, like you see line figures in the yeah, like line drawing. Yeah. So yeah, little stick, stick figures. Yeah. Yep. Indeed. Any other title ideas? We need two to tango. Two to tango. That's good. Anything else? Oh, and it dripped. So I held it vertically. Ooh, now it's gotten very, now there's some crime going on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And I forget that sometimes. And I'm usually in the middle. I'm usually not picking it up and, and showing it up. Uh, no, I've never, I've never used spray. I have some, I've spray painted things. You know, just covered it with uh, with color, but I haven't ever really tried. And the, the challenge for me is in my studio, uh, uh, spray is not allowed because it would go everywhere and we'd all breathe it, breathe it in. Oh. oh, I haven't tried that. I have tried though with the uh, hair dryer blowing, blowing it because I, I met an artist who did that. She had all this. This you know is watercolor, but it was all like flying everywhere. And I was like, "How did you do that?" She's like hair dryer, so she pushes you know the the pigment around with the with with air. Even the before painting. Oh, before yeah, yeah. With the, and sometimes with the, with heat that kind of melts it and moves it around. Yeah, I've seen that a lot uh, as well. Is that your artwork on your cushion? Yes. I yes. <laughs> Alien invasion. Oh, it's so good. I love that. Um, uh, this piece is uh, special, um, but it just reminds me. Uh, I think it's this one. Yeah, uh, I had a very big print of this at a outdoor show one time, and an Ethiopian uh, two Ethiopian men came up, and they were convinced that this was Ethiopian that there was, and they pointed to pieces. They're like, that's a symbol for love. That's that, that's that. They're like, 
where are you from? How do you know all these things? Like, I am like Ukrainian, Jewish, uh, third generation in the US, so no ties to Ethiopia whatsoever. Uh, but the passion that they had and how convinced they were that that, that just affirmed for me that everyone is seeing different things. They're creating their own meaning for what things mean. And to me, that's a really successful piece when you've engaged someone like that, that they are finding things in it that mean something to them. And that's again, why I come back to like, it doesn't matter what I was thinking when I was making this much more interesting to tell me what, what you were thinking. But I always, when this piece in particular, I think about that because they guys were so impassioned that this was an Ethiopian piece. They did not buy it though. I really wanted them to take it home. But they did not. Uh, but uh, I, in fact, somewhere I have a picture of them just kind of dissecting this whole piece and telling me, telling me all about what what was in it for them. Uh, love that. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and like slide this over and work on another. How are we doing on time? Can I keep going or? Ten minutes. So here's here's a piece that just did. I drew it at some point. I don't even remember, uh, but we'll start we'll start drawing drawing on this. So this was just a a piece that was in my notebook. It looks like family. Yeah. Family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. the Valentine is also there. Yeah. The heart. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my favorite number is three, uh, and so when they, there's multiple figures, you'll find them in three. I just did a show last November at the studio that was all kind of based in threes and that kind of triangle of, of relationships that we have and just my favorite favorite number. No, uh, I grew up in stock, but I live in Sunnyvale now. In San Jose, yeah. So if any of you haven't ever been, uh, visual philosophy, uh, is an art school. Uh, so they're, uh, it's owned by a couple. Um, one is, uh, Dana is the printmaker and your, your husband is the sculptor. And so they've been running the school for, I don't know how long, many years, at least eight or nine years. They've been running it. This is their second location. They had a different location, San Jose. They moved to this location. And so they generally teach printmaking classes and sculpting classes, but then they also do all sorts of different kinds of classes. Uh, and what they do is they have they rent out studio space to artists to supplement the income. So to pay the rent for the building, they don't have to rely just on the classes uh, to make that income. They have all these artists that are there. And so we get to have, you know, relatively affordable studio space, and then we get access to all of their equipment. So I have, you know, 24 hour access to all the printmaking, all the sculpting tools, all the tools that they have on there. So it's really, it's really beneficial uh, to me. Uh, we have a second Saturday event every second Saturday. So the second Saturday, instead of first Friday, second Saturday, uh, it's 11 to two. And they always have, we have an art law art show. So we have walls in the front space and we do a little art show. Uh, there's a different artist every, every month. Uh, like I said, I did one in November. I'll have another one in this coming September. Uh, and uh, they invite other artists. You can apply, even if you're not a, a studio artist, you can apply to have a show there. Relatively cheap too. I think it's like a $15 fundable fee uh, for getting that space. No, 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 you can just apply to have a show. It's pretty full. I think they're booked up for the year already. And so you'd be applying for 2024. Uh, but that's their scheduling that far in advance. But they the woman who just had her show last Saturday. She's not a studio artist. She's just an artist that applied. Uh, and so they're trying to do that, to, you know, diverse, show diverse artists and not just the ones that are in the studio. I think we get first preference. Uh, but if they don't have anyone to do, uh, uh march then then there's an opening for someone else to do you can also join i think you can also join as a member and not be a studio artist but pay a membership fee that gives you access to all the equipment if you don't want a studio but you want to get access to all their tools so i think they sell a membership as well 
Um, it ranges. I have a bigger studio. I have a 12 by 12. It's about $600 a month uh, for that space. They have smaller ones that are 12 by eight. They have a couple of little weird sized ones around. Uh, I heard now there's a waiting list now uh, for a studio space. Um, but uh, get on the waiting list if you're if you're interested. Come check it out. Yeah, uh, yeah check it out if you're if you're interested. Uh, the physical address. Um, well, if you can find it online, probably the best way. Visual philosophy. Uh, so mentioned the moment you are so, I think someone please mention that on now. The city Alameda, no, the Alameda downtown, yes, yes, yeah, the, yeah. So, visual philosophy studios are the art studios, and then the school is called the, the School of the Visual Philosophy, yeah, it's a school entity. There's kind of two entities, uh, I'll also throw a shout out for Clyde Gallery. If you've never been to Clyde Gallery. Uh, it's my gallery downtown. It's right across the street from Original Joe's. Mm -hmm. And it's a not a collective, but there's, I think, 70 artists who have permanent wall space there. And you, there you can, if you get accepted, you can pay uh, a very affordable fee to have your own wall there and put whatever you want on the wall. And then they have someone there to sell your art uh, for you so you don't have to actually be there. And they're open every, well, they're open all, every weekend. And then they do First Friday. Every every first Friday, that's called Collide Gallery. K A L E I D. Oh, you did? Got all the info. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I try to go as many first Fridays. He, I see him there all the time. Yeah. 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 Next first Friday. Yeah, I recommend it. I mean, First Fridays, like, you can't get any better. It's free. There's no cost if you don't buy anything. You know, it's, you know, you, it's free the, for, for First Friday. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great thing to do. Hours of entertainment. I do it almost every First Friday. It's my favorite thing to do. Is to go and see my friends and see openings, yes. talk about art. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I really encourage people to do it. Like it's just super fun, and and the diversity of art is just astounding. You know, there are sculptors and painters and fiber artists and video artists and. You know, everything you can think of represented and just San Jose, the South Pole, South Bay is just really robust, as you all know, uh, uh, with art and artists. I really love it. I lived in Oakland and had a kind of Oakland family, art family there. Uh, and then I moved to the South Bay and it took me a little while to like find find the community. But, but once I found it, I was like, yes, it's really, uh, for me, very uh, fulfilling and, and fills up my soul to like have uh, artists around me to talk about art. Yeah, yeah, maybe so, maybe so. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I had an embarrassing moment with my child uh, at an art opening where he knocked over a sculpture because he was like he was little and he's goofing around and I was just mortified that we had knocked over a sculpture and I thought that we had bought it uh, but it was uh it seemed to be okay but that was kind of ter terrifying what's that dog no it's not the dog balloon it's not the dog balloon no um but I I did have one time at Clyde uh when uh we have featured shows they really encourage the artists to come uh after first Friday to come on Saturday and just be there to talk about the show. And so uh, often we'll go there and we'll bring paint. And so I was painting there and a kid came up and just grabbed one of my pens and started writing on my <laughs> And so that was like, I wasn't prepared, uh, prepared for that. But in the spirit of there are no mistakes and everything happens for a reason, that his mark stayed on there and that piece sold. And so someone has 
someone has that thing. I'm the only one who knows that that was his uh, his scribble, but that was just the kind of challenge of when you're doing live events and there's people around. I really had to get used to this. Uh, I got practice at the studio when we'd have events and when they want some kind of live art happening because I think people really like watching you know, people make. And when I first started doing it, having people talk to me while I was painting really threw me. I was not used to having commentary while I was making, making it. And so that was hard, but do it as anything, doing it again and again and again, I got used to it. Now I really kind of like it. So I, I yearn for those kind of live painting events where you're getting the energy and people can ask questions while you're doing it, got used to it. But when I started, it was really weird to have, I was so used to just being by myself and suddenly there are people looking at me and, you know, judging what I'm doing. But I'm like, oh no, that's not what I want. Uh, but yeah, you do it again and again, then you get used to it. But that's really only the only moments I could think of when my son knocked over a sculpture, and then when another little kid drew on my drawing. We got a all fast demo artist. Live oh. demo artist. All fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really <laughs> fun. I really, uh, I really like, especially if I can get people to give me titles, you know, uh, when the pieces uh, are fresh. Yeah. yeah. Any other any other questions about showing? I know a lot about art galleries down in San Jose. When you do the art walk, you get to meet uh, all those people and meet the gallerists. I really recommend if you're interested in being, you know, uh, part of that scene, is uh, uh, just go. Like I said, it's free. You don't have to pay. You can just show up. And if you keep showing up, that's what I did. Like I just started going the first Friday, and then it took a while. It took like five years. But after five years ago on the first Fridays, I knew everyone. You know, I knew the gallerists, I knew who to talk to. I started talking and pitching my own, you know, artwork and they, and it wasn't like I was a stranger. They like recognized me from being at every first Friday for the past however many years. So that's kind of the way to do it. And it doesn't, not just San Jose, same thing, San Francisco, any place. Just, I think if you, you keep showing up and uh, then you eventually get to know people. And if that's your interest and that's what you want to do, then. That's a, a great way to do it. Like I said, for free, you can just show up and be at the art of this. Um, I have a question about the the pens. Yeah. Um, so are are these color fast? Color or, fast. Or, they're acid free, okay. so they should. If they're protected, they should. The color should last uh, a pretty long time. But what was the term you said? Color fast. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I'm, that's why I kind of upgraded from ink to acrylic. You know, when I was using the early days of just using Sharpies, like over the years, Sharpies that will fade because uh, they're not acid free. Exactly. Um, but I have drawings come to my studio. I have drawings that have been that are 20 years old and they're pretty as dark as but they also they're out of direct sunlight. They're also some of them are framed, so they're protected. Um, but I've seen I have some like color sharpie drawings that definitely have like faded. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. I still no, no, no. Um, no, no. I have black. There's I can get black paper somewhere. Um, just black paper. Oh, the white really like looks nicely on that. Um, I also uh, sometimes buy a black canvas. In my canvas, it's already pre, uh, pre-colored. Uh, for the most part, I'm using white. Um, originals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all originals. They're all because I don't title of them. Uh, I date them. And so on the back of every one of my drawings is the date, just so I can keep track of which one is which. And when someone wants something or... Uh, you know, I have to uh, be good about cataloging, especially because I put them up on my website and try to sell them. Uh, so I need to know which one is which. And because the titles themselves are loose and given by other people, then the way for me to track them really well is just the date. So 
the whatever date they're drawn. And if I draw more than one drawing on a day, it just gets a dash, dash two, dash three. Uh, well, here's a blue. So yes, one color. Mm, not always. In general, I think I was doing one color. There's, there's a couple. There's a couple colors. That one. But uh, I think that's me with, you know, having to control and like not do too much. That was one thing that I've kind of learned is it just part of, uh, you know, flexing those muscles is combining yourself to one color or two colors or three, then you don't get out of control with too much color. And uh, these were just me experimenting with the black paper, the gold, but yeah, just one color. Just trying to keep it simple and kind of you know focus on the figure and and not add add too much color but there's no rule i can I, yep yep the gold pen is in here somewhere the metallic, the metallic. oh yeah that's a, that's a canvas yeah that's can and that's a black canvas they use mm -hmm. yeah when you yeah. do human like the one you have to do, do you see something like now we have there is email, I don't know, email, like, contrasting. Um, mm -hmm. This is done or you're going to do more? No, this was, I didn't even know I had this. I just opened up my book and saw it. I was just going to uh, uh, add to it. But yeah, so this is, I either I ran out of time or I got bored or I'd leave. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I have a piece actually. The piece that I just posted on my Instagram uh, is a piece that sat. It sat for a year, uh, and I found it in a notebook, and then added a couple other layers to it. And so it's really interesting. So it was a whole year long find that the first part was one year, and then the whole second part came. A whole year later, just because uh, just playing around in my studio. Yeah, yeah, sure. It took a year. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea when I did this. So, however long ago this was, I have no recollection of it. Uh, so it was just I have a lot of pads. So often I open them up and find uh, find drawings, and sometimes they don't get finished. I'm just not inspired and don't know what I was doing, and so. Uh, but a lot of times I'll just like add add to it. But if you're interested, please follow me on Instagram. Uh, that's where my main platform for where I uh, collect titles. Uh, it's the Jamal Show uh, on uh, Instagram and on Facebook and on TikTok. Uh, TikTok is over just videos, so just the time lapse videos on uh, TikTok. But uh, Instagram will have all all sorts of stuff on it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all online. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. That's so great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was fun watching. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop recording here.